ओम ब्रह्मानंदम परम सुगतम केवल ज्ञान मूर्ति द्वंद्वातीत गगन सदर्श तत्व सेलक्ष्यम एक विमलमचल सर्वदी साक्षिभूत भावातीत त्रिगुणरहित सद्गु तम नमा सो दे एक्चुअली स्वामी जी महाराज हैज गिवन मी अ लिटिल डिफिकल्ट सब्जेक्ट टू हैंड ई सेड दैट uh is there any way for spiritual advancement when you don't have devotion you don't have fact is not such an easy thing to say because i personally believe that you need to have whatever you do some amount of devotion so i'm going to now examine devotion and then is there a way okay now before that i am in some way uh, in many ways linked also to the ram krishna mission uh, and so i want to tell you something we have all seen uh, and read uh, thakur uh, sri ram krishna's uh, biography and um, we have many of us might have read the gospel and so on one thing is very interesting that once apparently thakur sri ram krishna told swami vivekananda who we think is a complete yogi and a gyani and a gyani that actually i am a gyani but inside outside i look like a bhakta you look like a gyani but you are actually a bhakta now this is a big statement which means even though swami ji mostly talking about advaita vedanta and uh, um the yoga sutras of patanjali his translation is one of the best which called raja yoga collection and yet deep down he was a bhakta a devotee and that his guru knew best we can't dispute it because i think he knew his heart so when you see devotion therefore i want to now examine a chapter of the bhagavad gita I'm sure many of you most of you all of you probably know about the Bhagavad Gita it's one of the most important textbooks um uh, in the curriculum for the study of Vedanta or the Prasthana Traya of the three important textbooks Upanishads Brahma Sutras and the Gita so it's a very important textbook on these matters and in the Bhagavad Gita there are many chapters there are 18 chapters starting from arjuna vishada yoga and so on you know the first chapter is arjuna vishada yoga which means the yoga of arjuna's sorrow the yoga of arjuna's confusion and so on because it's a sanskrit word you need many words to describe insecurity confusion sorrow okay so starting with that it goes on to sankhya <coughs> karma karma yoga sankhya yoga karma and so on dhyana yoga then when he comes to chapter number 12 it's called bhakti yoga yoga of devotion 12th chapter the usual question people ask is why if bhakti is so important why did uh, vyasa write it as a 12th chapter why not first chapter and it is important there is no doubt it's right almost in the middle now why did it take 11 chapters to talk about bhakti yoga why not start the reason is i think and my master also explained this to me arjuna was not prepared to have devotion not yet so devotion is not something which you know like i don't think devotion can be cultivated it's something that happens spontaneously but for that some background requirements are necessary then it happens one way it can happen is when there is a great soul like sri ramakrishna paramahamsa or some great saint who is already filled with devotion and who is always in the ecstasy of devotion such people or chaitanya mahaprabhu they can make you make your devotion well up by a touch 
but this is not you it cannot be done it's not so easy it's it, if somebody says i'm doing it you have to be very careful only a few people could have done this also the recipient has to be sensitive enough to receive <laughs> so it's not possible simply to catch somebody and say here yeah ramkrishna did that once when in his last days he touched a lot of people and said may you have devotion and they were but this is not so common it's not so easy so therefore one shouldn't suppose that devotion is something meant for you know ordinary folk or that it is meant for uh, villagers who don't know anything actually it's a very important and uh, most important part of otherwise do you think you can find the reality or the supreme reality by simply sitting down and breathing up and down is the divine uh, so such so foolish as to give you a vision because you are breathing up and down when other characteristics are not there i'm not against pranayam i also teach but it's not that so therefore it's a very important aspect this devotion it's one of the most otherwise everything is dry you can do a lot of vedantic speculation but if the heart is in there it is not done so therefore now i'm going to look at this in the 12th chapter of the gita why wait till the 12th chapter okay now till the 9th chapter of the gita krishna is sitting on the chariot i'm mean driving the chariot arjuna is sitting there and uh, they talking to each other almost like friends even though arjuna accepts him and the gita vyasa has written sri bhagavan uvacha the words of bhagavan and so on still they are like friends they are like relatives they are like close friends in india nowadays nobody makes friends with the driver but here it was so at that time they were very close friends <laughs> well my driver is a good friend of mine unfortunately he's not had become krishna so um, <laughs> so till ninth chapter it's like a conversation between the two simple how to do the, how to meditate how to do this how to do that and then suddenly in the 10th chapter krishna does a trick not a trick he does something something happens the, the whole thing changes because suddenly he says among the mountains i am the himalaya no not among the mountains among the immovables achala among the immovables i am the himalaya among the mountains i am meru among the munis sages i am kapila among the vedas i am samavid so arjuna is a little worried now this guy who was talking to me one to one who is vasudeva uh, suddenly he turns around and says i am meru i am the himalaya so what happened to arjuna here in the 9th chapter he slowly confused a little bit his ordinary uh, mode of logic which is 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 is gets a little dent here one shot because a man who is talking now suddenly subhash turns around and says i am the meru among the mountain what will happen to me i think is this subhash or is this something else so the whole see we think we are very logical but our logic is very limited because we have a limited mind so here in the 9th chapter the first shot then comes the 10th chapter uh, 11th chapter i'm sorry 10th chapter then the 11th chapter 11th chapter arjuna's so called logical framework is completely broken because this man who was sitting here suddenly changes into something tremendous so he sees the whole world is coming into him and going out and so what has happened here is that he realizes then that my so called logic you know the which i thought was perfect is not so so then what to do that's where devotion comes devotion i think for people who are not born with it or who have not been blessed by great saints probably comes when you realize the limitations of your intellect mm-hmm. because intellect is very limited see after all our intellect is based on the limited data that is provided to us by our five senses we don't have a sixth sense i mean we need to but we don't 
generally. So the five senses, you know the five senses, the instruments of perception. This is the sixth sense, but the five senses like eye, ear, smell, taste and touch, the panchendriyas. And only data that the mind gets or the brain gets, use any word you like, is through this. And these instruments of perception are very limited in their scope. Not only limited, they may even be misleading sometimes. I'll give you a simple example. Every morning we see the sunrise. Every evening we see the sunset. You ask a schoolboy, he would tell you that the sun neither rises nor sets. But what do we see? The sun rising. How much can you trust the eyes? And there are these optical illusions, you know, school children enjoy it. So, what you see may not, the, the, the statement, seeing is believing, is not so correct, not so accurate. Sometimes seeing is not the truth. Sometimes. Not always. I see you, I know you're here. But, <laughs> but so what happens, so at best, the instruments of perception which provide the data, the inputs, at best are imperfect and at the worst may even be illusory, maybe. So how much can we depend on the so-called intellectual framework provided by limited imperfect data, that's the only way we can get through the five senses. So the ancient sages said, well, when you are looking for something infinite, this is not going to help. But for that you need to realize it, of course, through intellectual understanding. But when you have understood it, then you begin to understand that there is some other element here which we haven't touched. And that element can come about only through a seed of devotion, little bit. And then that seed can expand and grow and grow. So, first thing is if you think you don't have devotion. I think everybody has some manifestation of devotion in some way. The wife is devoted to the husband, the husband is devoted to the wife, or maybe the children, and so on. So, there is some amount of when you love somebody, it's also a kind of devotion. It's a small kind of devotion. So what I'm trying to say is the heart should not be considered as unimportant. It's very, very important. Compassion, love, affection, everything is when I say heart, I'm not talking about the organ that pumps blood. I'm talking about my inner identity, my core of my consciousness. Hridaya. Now it's very interesting that Hridaya is the place from which Daya comes. <laughs> Compassion comes. So anyway, so now, therefore, having said this, I want to examine Krishna's definition of a great devotee in the 12th chapter of the Gita. We consider Krishna to be a perfect authority to say this. So Arjuna begin, it's one of the few chapters which in the Gita which starts with Arjuna Vacha. Arjuna said. Most of chapters are Sri Bhagavan Vacha, Krishna said. One of the chapters, twelfth chapter, Arjuna Vacha. So it's meant for all of us. We are all Arjunas in that sense. We are insecure, we are not sure, we are you know, indecisive, we are sometimes in sorrow. So, the Gita is not meant for that Arjuna, it's also meant for these, all of us. I'm including myself. <laughs> so, in the twelfth chapter, Arjuna Vacha, Arjuna asks Krishna, I want to clarify this doubt. Some say that those who worship the Supreme Being as the formless, absolute, um, almost unreachable, um, transcendent supreme reality. Some say that that's the best way and they are the greatest of yogis who do that. Now in this chapter the word yogi and the word bhakta are interchanged. Somewhere Krishna says, Yama, yaha bhakta same priya, this bhakta is dear to me. The question asks, ask this, is the, who is the greatest of yogis? greatest of devotees, interchangeable here. So, uh, are they the greatest or are those who look upon you or worship you or want to attain you as you standing before me in form, 
with your form among these two who are the greatest of yogis if you tell me i will agree with this because i don't think there is any other authority here i'm not saying okay gita <laughs> so krishna goes about it in a very nice way come come here come is okay <laughs> so krishna goes about it in a very beautiful way instead of directly instead of directly dealing with the question as he usually does does it in a little bit of a roundabout fashion which is what lawyers do in the courts um uh, he says well it's all right there have been great sages who worshiped or looked upon the supreme being as formless ultimate um abstract and so on they are also great yogis okay but please remember that you are a human being and we human beings mostly are dependent on shape on form and name isn't it how do i recognize you when i I have seen you, and when you say your name, I know you are so and so. Nama, name, Rupa, form. So we are all human beings are generally dependent on Nama Rupa. Please don't tell me we are not. What do we do in the morning when we wake up first? Tell me. Look at the mirror in the wash basin. How many hairs have become grey, black? Is the eyebrow plucked properly? Right. brush your teeth and look three times to see if it is clear because we love our own form <laughs> we love our own name if somebody calls me by a wrong name i might get upset i don't but it's possible to get upset so we are so hung up on name and form nama rupa therefore krishna says to arjuna while it's okay that some great beings have worshiped the supreme as the formless and so on and abstract it's better to have something to hold on to and therefore it's easier to do this because we are name and form oriented however then he says it doesn't matter what the approach is whether you are worshiping the supreme being without form or whether you are approaching the supreme being as with form it's completely up to you how you are but there are some important factors involved if i have to say that somebody is a great devotee or somebody is a great bhakta and what is that according to the gita it's not somebody who's all the time singing god's praise which is okay which is good uh, it's not somebody who is all the time shouting god god he says three characteristics are important if one has to be called according to me a great devotee or a great yogi and what are the three uh, qualities attributes he says don't worry about the method Ramakrishna Paramahamsa said this very beautifully. He said, "No matter which way you approach, because here is a man, a man or whatever person who has gone through each path himself, himself, and come out and said, 'Hey, it's, hey, it's the same thing. I have seen this this way. I have seen it that way. It's the same thing.'" He said. So, in the same way, Krishna says to Arjuna in the Gita. It doesn't matter how you worship. It doesn't matter how you think of the supreme being, because anyhow, it's only your thought. You really don't know what it is. Well, he doesn't say that. I'm saying this. Unless you touch and understand, you don't know what it is. You can only conceive. That's okay. How you approach. However, there have to be some attributes before one becomes a devotee or a yogi. And what are the attributes? First. samniyam indriya gramam one who has control over his senses sense organs when i say sense organs it of course includes emotions because emotions are caused by exposure to the outside world with the sense organs one who has control over his senses it doesn't say one who kills his senses one who is controlled over his senses which means one who does not allow the senses to run away or rather says knows where they are going and where to stop and how to proceed control so samniyam indriya gramam one who is 
the capacity to hold the senses together. It also means holding the senses together. Usually if you watch carefully, we are likely to indulge too much in one sense than the other. And we hold it together. Okay. The second quality. Sarvatra Samabuddhaya. Is it possible to keep your mind tranquil under all circumstances? Very difficult. You know how our life is usually. When something nice happens. We think it's nice. We are in cloud nine. Hmm? And when something happens terrible, we are down in the dumps. This is our life, up and down. Right? And so, where is the tranquility there? Sometimes it's high and sometimes it's low. Sometimes high blood pressure, sometimes low blood pressure. Now, Krishna says, if you can keep tranquil in the middle, you can't change all the circumstances on this earth. It's impossible. You can do some. You can tinker a bit, but you can't change everything. So, in the midst of all this situation, is it possible for us to remain tranquil without falling up or flying too high? And Sarvatra Sama Buddhaya, so that the Buddhi can remain tranquil. And he also, in other parts of the Gita, it's, it is said, can you remain tranquil in the midst of sorrow and happiness, both? Happiness also can create problems, as sorrow does. Sorrow we know, but we will never expect, accept that happiness also can cause problems. Too much happiness. So, so, in Sukha and Dukkha, in pain and pleasure, Heat and cold, now heat and cold is a metaphor, saying two extremes. In um, praise and blame, now this is the most important. You know, we can get over everything, but this dependence on praise is something very difficult to get out of. And blame. If somebody says you are a great man, it's okay with me, I'm happy. But if somebody says you are a fool, then I'm in trouble. That guy is also in trouble if I'm a strong man. <laughs> so this is our life. We depend on public opinion and decide what we are. Krishna says, can you find out for yourself what you are? No matter what somebody says. I always ask people, if somebody calls me a fool, suppose. I may be a fool. Babaji, my master used to tell me, if somebody calls you a fool, don't get angry, go and look at the mirror, you might be a fool. <laughs> See, that's one thing. The other is, if somebody calls you a fool and if you don't know English, what does it matter? <laughs> and if I know Hindi, I might think they're calling me a fool, flower. <laughs> it's language. It's the language and the meanings we built out of it. So can we stay? Thank will considering these things that it doesn't matter what people are saying, this, that. What does it matter really? In fact, I think sometimes that blame is better than praise because if you are, if everybody is flattering you, you don't know where you are going wrong. You remain in the same place. When somebody is criticizing you, he may be doing it for a different reason, but it hits you and you, you need to assess yourself again. Maybe I'm wrong. There may be something wrong. But if you keep flattering, oh, I don't see this. So, in praise and blame, can we consider blame as lessons given by God? That the great teacher has come in the form of the other guy and he's saying, you're a fool. Can we do that? Then, under all circumstances, the mind remains quiet. You have United Nations, then it becomes a united mind. <laughs> So, this is a requirement. And Krishna says, if a person is like this, which means, and samnyam indriya gramam, then, yaha bhakta same priya, that bhakta is the dearest to me. There's one more, last. Sarva bhuta hite rata. 
one who has the welfare of all living beings in his or her heart. He doesn't say her, but I'm saying it's meant as for humanity. So, sarva bhuta hite rata, one who has the welfare of all, that means he does not hate anybody. Can he, can a person live like this? Such a person is considered by Krishna to be a great yogi and also a great bhakta. And if one starts living like this, very soon we will see the limitations of our logic and they begin to look for something else. Now that's something else that wells up in the heart for no reason whatsoever. If you cultivate it, it's only a cultivated thing. It's bhakti. And I think those who still feel it's missing, I think everybody has to some extent, can fan it up by looking into these things and saying, I need to go there. I need to look into this. I need to understand that there are things far more than my intellect. I mean, because my intellect is very conditioned, it's very finite. And to break out of that and reach the ultimate, which is infinite, one needs to understand our limitations. When you understand your limitations, what happens? You're humble. And humility is the first step. And when you understand that, you also know that you don't know. And if you don't, if you know, how can you move? I don't know, so let me find out. So humility. So this all together would be the source of bringing out the devotion, which is already innate in every one of us. I can't believe it's not there. It's there. Um, and Sometimes devotion wells up for no reason whatsoever. I met a gentleman today at the retreat. He was there yesterday also from India who said that he has everything that a material world would consider to be good. A lot of money, he has a place, he has everything. He, is, he doesn't have any sorrow at the moment. At the moment. But he says when I go to a temple or a church, Tears come into my eyes and something is happening in my heart. What is this? I said, you're not going mad. <laughs> I said, it must be the result of many this way that this is happening. There is some link. And I think it's there in all human beings in the form of a seed in the heart. It needs to be fanned and awakened. And it can, as I said, there are great people who can awaken it. But don't believe everybody who says, I can touch you. Anyway. <laughs> we are living in a terrible world. But there have been people. And also, when we understand the limitations of the intellect and are still looking for something, then slowly one begins to understand that there may be other ways of doing this. People say that those people who are intellectuals are those who read the Upanishads and Vedanta. Let me tell you, that the ultimate aim of the Upanishad or the Vedanta is to convince you that your intellect is limited. Also to tell you that the most intelligent person quickly realizes the limitations. It's difficult for a less intelligent person to realize this, realizes the limitations. In fact, the Upanishad says, should I say Sanskrit or English? Yen manasana manyute yanahur manomatam tadeva brahmatvam vidvi nedam yadidam upasate. It's a big sweeping statement. It means that which even the mind cannot conceive. So, what kind of mind? The ordinary mind, which is enmeshed in this world, which cannot free itself. Even that mind cannot reach that. So, what do we do? Surrender the mind. Let go and rejoice. That's why the Ishavash Upanishad says, Tena Tyaktena Bhunjita, let go and rejoice. So, the main problem is our ego, which makes us think that we are so intellectual we don't need devotion. I think we all have it in some way. 
and when we understand our limitations it will probably spark again or it may spark when you meet holy people who have already whose spark has become a flame it is possible too so no point in stretching it any further i rest my case now if you have any questions on this subject not something else don't ask me what is sufism i mean this is not there in i can of course but that's not um, we can discuss it it should be more of a dialogue we can discuss or do you want me to ask a question Hello. Sir, I need one of your please. Ah yes. Mr. Rajamani. Yes. This devotion is the beginning of surrender or it is ultimate of surrender. Okay. Now, now we have to go into this as uh, the 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 signs or the map of devotion. when i go to a temple or somewhere and put my hands up and say please give me a promotion now that's also devotion in a small way okay uh but the final the para bhakti which is called the highest now that devotion where i ask for things in a worldly way is something that comes before surrender now the highest devotion is called para bhakti where the devotee wants nothing except a vision a darshan or a feeling of the deity of the supreme being that comes with surrender the other forms of bhakti which are also bhakti because we are human beings right uh, yeah is there not a conflict between this concept of uh, devotion and karma yoga no in karma yoga the basic principle is that you bear the consequences of your action okay and when you come to define uh, uh, yoga abhakta in terms of asking for delivery in other words You are, there is a kind of I did. I no, no, no. I was not discussing that. Uh-huh. What I was saying is that is also a form of bhakti. Uh-huh. When there is nothing. As long as you recognize any yeah. form of bhakta, right. it creates a. If you define that, you create a contradiction. That is between dharma yoga. That is that that yoga. that is because you already read about karma yoga, uh-huh. and dharma yoga, and so on. But there are many people who haven't. <laughs> See. so for them even that is devotion i have a small image in my room every day i do seva that is also a kind of devotion i you're right they may not have read about karma yoga and dharma yoga so that's what i'm saying and from there one might advance slowly and go to the next step which is why that's why i said that in the gita all this is there not only is there karma yoga there is also bhakti yoga and there is sanyasa yoga and everything has been covered why because different people are in different stages of evolution we can't say everybody is in the same stage of it i mean spiritual evolution not physical physically i think we have evolved and become human beings and now we are devolving into complete animals mm-hmm. but i'm not talking about that um, i'm <laughs> talking about the mind we are in or the psyche we are in different stages of evolution therefore different levels of understanding will be there of course your level is one and somebody else is so somebody may not have any such knowledge but still he may believe there is something let me ask for that's what i meant not whether we should ask or should not ask actually it's it's not it's very funny to ask if you consider the supreme being to be all knowing why would you go and petition so the best thing would be please let me have what is right but we have in troubled times we sometimes go and ask 
for wishes to be fulfilled, which is okay. We are weak human beings. So it happens. You know, I, in this matter, I want to tell you something. And Swamiji can vouch for it or correct me if I... You know, at one point, Swami Vivekananda himself was in a bad state while his guru, his Thakur was still alive. At one time, his father died suddenly and he had already decided to become a monk. He hadn't become, but thought in his mind. And his family was passing through a very difficult time. He was a proud man. I mean, in the proud in the sense that he was not a man who could be easily broken. And yet he was broken because there was so much trouble, so much difficulty. He didn't know where his next meal came from. He was looking for jobs in Calcutta in every street in the heat of summer and everybody refused him a job. He had already got a degree. And it was so bad that when his mother said, have your food, he would say, I already had my food because he thought there may not be enough for both. The heart was there, of course. So in that state, he went one day, long time he didn't go to Dakinishwar to meet his guru. One day he went and he told Sri Ramakrishna, Today I am going to ask you something which I have never asked you before. Very material thing. Please do something so that I can find a job, be happy. Ramakrishna said, Don't you know that I can never ask the mother for any material thing, either for myself. So how about for you? It's My tongue doesn't, my mouth doesn't open if I try that. Doesn't work. So I have an advice. You go and ask. Go. So apparently, Swami Vivekananda went into the Kali temple and the puja was going on, the Arati. And the lights were lit. He just went there and stood. And he saw the mother. As if she was alive. He stood there for a long time enjoying the scene and came back. And Thakur said, Hey, what happened? Did you ask? Oh, he said, No. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> I forgot because I didn't feel the need to ask for anything. I came back. I was full of joy. He said, Go back. Three times he sent him. And three times a man could not ask anything because he was already in such bliss that there was nothing for him to ask. Then when he came back, Thakur said, Okay, from now on, your food and shelter will be looked after. Now I'm looking at very... Yeah, I have another question. Uh, why Gita is basically a discourse between Krishna and... But can one complete this... Uh, can it remain complete without taking what role Krishna plays during the war mm -hmm. for Shaita. Yeah. Because if you look at it, the principles enshrined in Gita, which is the discourse which is argument, and I, very right, because if we want to make it relevant in today's world, and I start with the, I was very happy you started with the word, Arjuna represents today's uh, human being, right. confused, and in fact, uh, if one looks at it, uh, one refers to Hindus in India totally confused, uh, don't know whether it is right or wrong, all of the time they are confused what is right or wrong. Now similarly, if you look at in, a, the, in the Mahabharata war, uh, Purikshetra, Krishna is also acting in this with Abhi Arjun, not with Arjun but with Pandavas and takes, advises certain strategic actions. Few of them are very important. To what extent question is raised, karma is dharmic. One, when he advises you this touch, you this touch to remain quiet, pushthama or mara gaya. Second is, when karn, karn is uh, taking the weed and he says now kill him tells Arjun and Arjun immediately asked, I am a Kshatriya, how can I do it? He said, when were you Kshatriya when Draupadi was being uh, insulted? He asked this question. Yes. Now these are very important questions and unless one understands this, 
I understand. And uh, let me tell you one more thing in this whole story. A very important point. Before the Kurukshetra war, before it starts, it's arranged that it is going to happen. Uh, Duryodhana and Arjuna both go to see Krishna. Mm. Krishna is lying on his bed. There is a door there and there is one chair there. <laughs> so Arjuna enters, he stands in front of him. Because he doesn't know what whose chair this is. You see this? Otherwise we would have gone and sat immediately. Duryodhana. Duryodhana comes and sits down in the chair. And he sits down. When Krishna wakes up and looks, he sees Duryodhana. And he says to him, So, what is it? He says, The war is going to start. I need your soldiers, I need your captains, I need your horses, I need your Weapons, I need, help me. He says, sure, take it, help me. And then he looks and sees, oh, Arjuna is also there standing. So I asked Arjuna, what do you want? He said, I don't want anything, I want you. <laughs> so you know what happened in the war. Arjuna had him and Duryodhana had everything else. So that's also in context. Yeah, yeah it's a context. You're right. <laughs> Dr. Saigal's uh, first question, I see. The first question is a, is a profound question. So actually, you see, if you look at the uh, sayings of Mahaprasna, mm -hmm. he talks about this point, this confusion, there's uh, many times a confusion. Because uh, as you have said that your destiny, your sukhadukkha is guided by your karma, then what is the rationale of your pain? Sri Ramakrishna answers say, that though karma decides, this karma follows there, which is giving you sukha and dukkha. Yet, karma is not uh, paramount. Karma is a law which is operated by the Supreme Lord. So, if you pray, the Supreme Lord who had made the karma law, <laughs> he can uh, do it otherwise. Kattum akattum annatha kattum. He may do this, he may withhold from doing this, and he may do it in another way. So, our, you see, certain times, you see, you see, you see there is a saying of uh, your Saudadi. Saudadi, you see, uh, there was a great bhakta of Sri Ramakrishna, and uh, Swami Krishna used to be higher to a devotees. He was going to place all devotees in the same category. So he was placed in a very high category. And he advised his parents, he said, not to arrange for any marriage for this boy. You see. But uh, they were in a hurry to arrange a marriage for this boy, whose name was Purva. And Sri Ramakrishna even predicted that uh, if he was given in marriage, he would have a uh, very premature death. So, after Sri Ramakrishna's passing away, he was only 21 and he was tremendously sick. So, Pindar's mother came to Saladi. You see, that you please do something, you bless him in a special way so that, you see, he is still young, uh, he should not die at this age. Sadhguru replied that, what can you do? You see, you go to Sri Ramakrishna and uh, pray for it, you see. 
when the mother left, when the mother left, commented that this lady willfully see, disobeyed Sri Ramakrishna. Now she has come to me. But Sri Ramakrishna is graceful. He has doubled his paranoia, mm -hmm. his longevity. He is 21. He will die, he will die at 42. You see. He has already doubled it. You see. <laughs> that was the comment. That shows that a kattum, a kattum, anatha kattum, you see, you have a destiny. God can at any moment modify it or change it. Mm. That is the rationale of prayer. So, in other words, uh, you would suggest there are two aspects of uh, devotion, or what you call the uh, more than karma yoga. Mm -hmm. Because in the karma yoga, basically, if you take the objective of any uh, human being, is liberation from rebirth, birth and rebirth. That is what we are seeking if we go to devotional aspects. Not all. Not all will get, but what will, that is what everybody seeks beyond karma yoga. And if, uh, this is one dimension of, the other is what, uh, Come on, you said. You had some questions. That was related to the example which you gave about Krishna sleeping, Duryodhana arriving and from the Mahabharata. At the Mahabharata. Mm -hmm. One thing is always confused, I am a confused person. So, there are so many extremes of the reality shown, Absolutely. even of the Supreme Krishna. On one side, he is Akshayani, Narayani, Sena. He is the Supreme, he says, I am the Nehru, all the hypers. At the same time, when he has a battle with Jarasan, he runs away. He leaves the battle thing. So, he's completely as a human strategic person that if I'm not winning the war, I should step back. Then again, it goes all the way high, saying, Vishwakarma has kept the whole Dwarka ready for him. So, like, you know, again, like, right. supreme. Right. Everything is ready to be at the right. sea, everything is right. just lifted right. up. Right. He can bring his right. whole Yadava cold and he can stay there. Yes. So this is where I always get confused. On one side the same person mm. who can win everything, but same is simple like in compared to Krishna. He runs away from Jarasana. So why That's why it's called run chod. Exactly. <laughs> we have run chod. <laughs> And that also gets people gets praying to that the person away. He prays to people. Absolutely. Now this this is this is the great thing about Krishna that it is a multiple personality. It is not one person. You cannot predict what he is doing at any moment. I mean, if you look at Krishna as a Purna avatara, as presented in the Mahabharat, he sometimes runs away, sometimes does. You can't judge and find a logic for these actions because he is working from a different dimension altogether. That's the thing. If we try to find reasons like an ordinary human being, then we are getting into trouble. We cannot put it there. That is a special being uh, whose actions may sometimes look funny, ridiculous to us, but they have their own uh, meaning. So that's where I can find to read that meaning. Like, you know, this is where I get confused. The first meaning. Suppose there is a meaning, and, and like if you yeah, yeah. are accepted that Krishna is the Supreme, ah. and if he is running away, he is not a simple person that he cannot defeat yeah. Jarasana. Absolutely, absolutely. If he can do, he can wait for 100 yes. wrong thing before he cuts someone's head. Yeah. So he definitely has a reason, but where we can understand? Like, what first understanding you should have is that you don't know anything about Krishna. First, we have to start from there <laughs> and then read the Bhagavat. First you start with this. I, I can't, don't say I don't understand, I can't figure out this. This seems very complicated to my brain because our brains are all like finite. So, and then read the Bhagavat. I suggest that you read the Bhagavad. And after reading the Bhagavad, if you still come up with this question, then read the, read the Narada Bhakti Sutras. Okay. Then after that, if you are still in, uh, in confusion, I would suggest 
that you read the gospel of ram krishna and sri ram krishna the great master because there are many parallels coming up of there which can be understood e- easier than this for us because he lived like an ordinary man in this state. but here krishna is something else right at least as it is given in the mahabharat so this is what i would suggest look like a human being human form and if you have that and but that itself given you you started with this is limitation of intellect now if you start analyzing the actions of krishna only with that intellect yes. then you find the uh, confusion arising and questions being raised And that, well, why, why, yeah, I know, but I fully appreciate questions because, yeah. you know, it's not that we should get away from questions. It's good to ask questions, good to, but at the same time, we should understand how far we can go. Yeah. That, of course, but questions are welcome. If you don't ask. There is also another point, you see. There is also another point. You must, uh, you say, mouth is a great thing, no doubt, you see. But uh, one thing you must remember that it was composed in many, many stories. Yeah. And perhaps, perhaps, we do not know as yet, perhaps it took, took almost 1,000 years. Mahabharata existed in some form or other at the time of Panini, mm-hmm. who is mm-hmm. uh, maybe a little before Buddha even. Mm-hmm. So it, uh, and Mahabharata, Certainly came to its uh, final form by the time uh, Christ appeared. Mm. Uh, so um, there are proofs of it. So it uh, took several centuries at least say, to complete it and it was in different stages. So that is one thing. And out of that, you see, uh, the, uh, the Krishna cult which you find in India in a very big way, it was certainly not there, you see, for example, Megasthenes. Megasthenes in his Indica writes about the Krishna cult in Mithra, that is Mathura. He does not talk about Krishna cult in the whole of India. So it was also evolving, you see. So, and the Bhagavata Purana is um, probably uh, the, uh, the latest Purana. Uh, latest Purana uh, to be composed. So all these things you must uh, remember. But what is more important about this Krishna, it is more important, uh, you say, uh, than the Mahabharata, etc., etc., is a Krishna who comes out as a result of your since many many hundreds of saints have taken Krishna as their ideal so out of that something has been created mm-hmm. you see when you adore something you see intensely etc there is something is created in the psychic universe So that Krishna is very much, you see, it is much more important than uh, what Krishna is there in Mahabharata, etc. Et because uh, Krishna appeared, Krishna talked to hundreds of saints. So that is much more important. So what you see in the Krishna, you see today, it is uh, the sum total of many, many things. So Maharaj, yes? would you say that about Sri Ram Krishna also? Sri Ramakrishna is a very recent, you see, it is, it will, it will be there as time goes on, for example, 20 centuries hence, 
you see, people, uh, many people will uh, take Sri Ramakrishna, will have a rapport with Ramakrishna. In, uh, uh, so, you see, uh, Ramakrishna also will uh, evolve, you see, in the, <laughs> That's what I'm in the, in the psychic universe. Yes. There is a creation in the psychic universe. Mm -hmm. You see, why you say so? So, Brahmananda, who is there, the beside of Swami, uh, you know, Dr. Vivekananda, he is in a posture of meditation, actually he is in a meditative mood there, in that picture. So, Brahmananda was once in visiting this Tirupati temple. Before entering the temple, he asked to whom this temple has been dedicated. <coughs> People around him said that it is a form of Narayana. He said, I have seen the Divine Mother. You see, please inquire. Even before entering the temple, he is seeing Divine Mother. <coughs> From inquiry it was found, this temple was dedicated to the Divine Mother. At the time of Ramanuja, it was changed. Because Ramanuja... The Sri Vaishnava, yes. So, was something else. So, this statue was modified. But this thing, which happened so many centuries ago, that has remained in the psychic universe mm -hmm. because of this tremendous adoration of the people. You see, and Sri Ramakrishna is seeing it. In uh, I mean, uh, Swami Brahmananda is seeing it some hundred years ago. Divine Mother, you see. So there is some creation in the psychic universe. I wanted to ask. I thought you wanted to ask. <laughs> it's more important devotion or surrender for spiritual advancement. Spiritual? For spiritual advancement, which is more important. I think it, you need to start with devotion and then it will ultimately has to become surrender. You have to start with devotion. In the highest stages of devotion, there is complete surrender. Because you are not important, only the deity is important. So you surrender yourself. But it has to start with devotion first. You can't surrender without that. How can you surrender? With devotion, you try and try and try and then you say, this is not working. It's surrender then. But if, without trying, you cannot surrender. Suddenly. In why I asked this question? In my native town, we have our temple of Lord Vishnu, where the Abhyasthas is Mamekam Charanam Braja. The Bhagavad Gita says that Sarvadharman Parichatya Mamekam Charanam Braja, Adam Tva Papetyo Moksha Kshami Masucha. So, right from childhood, my ancestors have taught me that you leave everything, don't look right or good or bad or this, just surrender to the God. He will create you, he will tune you such a way that he will do the karma, whatever karma you do, he will take care of it because you are surrendered to him. After that, Kayana Vacha Manasindha Vujyatnabha Prakadeshuva Karubhyasa Sakalam Parasvai Naranethi Samarpyam. That is what my ancestors have taught me. Have you done it? Uh, yeah, I am practicing it. That is what uh, this. So, my point is even the surrender, I am put, whether I have started the devotion, the journey, or I am in the ultimate journey, where is I am in the curve? That I can't tell you. <laughs> because, because the sadhana only will make me to reach my goal. Right. Just a concept that I have surrendered myself to the God, everything right from the morning till No, the but it should be real. It yeah. can't be just a word. Yeah, yeah. See, a person who has really surrendered will not grieve if things go wrong. Yeah. If you have surrendered and still grieve when things go wrong, then that is not surrender. I, uh, I take it uh, and I, I have followed it up that everything uh, I have, whatever, even please sitting... In which case, up. in which case, you have already reached the sthita prajna state and then uh, nothing much to do. <laughs> really, seriously. The sthita prajna is one who has, who has no such problems, he has settled everything, he has surrendered. And the Siddha Prajna is not made out from the dress that he wears. Yeah. Uh, so you could be one, I don't know. Quite no, possible. I, I am feeling that nothing, you are. nothing uh, affects me, whatever happens, 
It is. Yeah. I am sitting in front of you. But I want to ask you one question. Please. Uh, when you say nothing affects me, like does the pain of somebody affect you sometimes? No, that, that I. Somebody else, not yours. No, no, that I feel bad. It is, <laughs> it affects me such a way that the next day, next day morning when I sit in my prayer hall, I pray for them. Even in the road, I pray for them. Even I see some people. Because I have heard that a person who has reached a state of complete surrender is also full of compassion for other living beings. This is what I have heard. Uh, so I, I feel bad when I see somebody in a distress. Even if I hear somebody is in thing, I feel bad. Okay. okay. So there is no question here. <laughs> That's what I wanted to do. Very. Uh, only thing is, I was praying to Baba Ji that give me something to know where I am in the path of my devotional journey. That way, I went and read uh, the God lived with them the book, the seventeen uh, disciples how they. But what I saw is more than anybody, every disciple whom Ramakrishna adopted and gave them the diksha. They have tested him more than you know, people. So sometimes I feel, I mean, there also is doing the right devotion too, because that was also a form of devotion. To go inside the Himalayas and ask for that, okay, my Guruji said he is following me, I want a food. Let me see who will give me a food in this dense forest, there is nobody. Then a person comes and gives a uh, choice of his food. So when I read all that, I was taken aback. I mean, the turbulence of uh, that uh, yogi world, that that what uh, your book gave me a little soothing to that. I said, okay. You Only know. soothing. <laughs> no, the thing is that I felt that the Guru will take care of me. Like well, he, he took care of me. <laughs> that is why uh, in, in the garden of your house, you had the darshan of the um, Babaji, which was totally unexpected. Whereas your mother was inside the house uh, preparing food for you. Know, you. I have to tell you one more thing. that. It, while it was for me unexpected, it is a result of so many lives of aspiration. That I didn't know at that time. Of course, when you figure out uh, later on, then you see that the great beings appear once in a while, not always. So, like, uh, people always say, can you give us the spiritual experience? I say, sorry. First of all, I am not uh, uh, Ramakrishna and you are not Vivekananda. So please <laughs> understand this properly. <laughs> because some people say, oh, why th that person touched me and then like Swami Vivekananda, I attend some other. I said, just one minute. Swami Vivekananda is not you and that person who touched you is not Ramakrishna. It's very rare. It's not so cheap. It can't be done so easily. So uh, all we can do is be patient. People have the same question to Ramana Maharshi also. Mm -hmm. See, Ramana Maharshi, no, people say because Ramana Maharshi did not have a guru, so they think he didn't have a guru. No, 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 no wait a minute. And so, therefore, we don't need any, we, we are going to find out who I am. Now, can you find out who you are by simply sitting down and saying, who I am, who am I, who am I? Can we do that? We can't. He had an experience. From there, he came to this. There is no doubt that he was a great being. I have no <laughs> doubt. My opinion is your recorded sayings of Ramana Maharshi. I have read this thing. The question is being asked that J. Krishnamurti talks about, you say that you need not have any guru, any scriptures, nothing. What do you say about this thing? The reply of Ramana Maharshi was, you see, very, he said that, what does Krishna Murti know? <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was Ramana Maharshi's reply. What does Krishna Murti know? So I will come the voice on this subject, whether you require a guru or not. He says, for the vast majority of human beings, a quickening impulse is necessary. For vast majority of human beings, the quickening impulse is necessary. That is his answer to this question. 
that is there are many beings in this world. Rare. Yes, rare. Even in, they say that they are so much advanced in their earlier incarnation mm. that uh, they, they did not uh, require a quickening impulse in this life. You see. So, uh, you see, he says, Swami Vivekananda himself could not attain your, uh, the Nirvikalpa Samadhi without the Guru's grace. That's why in so many places in his writings he mentions it. He mentions it. Yeah. But Swami Maharaj, yeah. you are saying about genuine Gurus. Yes. What happens in this world now where there are more Gurus than disciples? <laughs> <laughs> Every corner you go, there is a good. I was such many years ago. <laughs> www.guru.com. <laughs> yes. This is because I was interested that you are doing this own business. And I found, to my surprise, they were mostly Americans. Really? Yes. No, there are Indians also. No, Indians are, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but uh, you see, Americans are beating. <laughs> <laughs> that means they have found that this is a very good function. Good business. <laughs> no, but 60% of such gurus are because of your, what you said, one of their quality, the praise. So our people, mm. our, our community is also responsible for it. Yeah. If someone slightly speaks something, immediately they make him a God. Guruji, Guruji, then he becomes a Guruji. That's another problem we have in our society. That is true. No, it's the like greed and fear of human beings. See, the other thing, the other thing is because shortcuts are provided. Yeah. Yes. And nowadays everybody is looking for a shortcut. And when you meet a guru, you think that he will change my life. Yes. He'll give everything yeah. what I want. Yeah. And six months, one year, nothing is happening. Oh, he's not good. Ah, that is another fellow, yeah. another guru. No, the other thing is that I have known people who are so serious and who found somebody and they gave all their lives and everything. And then in the end, they are suffering. Uh, they are in such a state. They don't know what to do, where to turn. This is also happening. So one has to be a little bit careful not to, about, not to be, yeah, like the Arabs say, um, trust in God but tie your camel. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, at least uh, in some organizations that danger is not there. Because everybody cannot set himself up as a guru. Only one from one, one source, the initiation comes. Then it is safe. But here everybody is doing so. And also some people are saying that they oh, can do Shakti Path. I, I always say, is that a joke? Can everybody do Shakti Path? That means I touch and you become a luminous. Is this possible? I mean it's possible in rare instances. It's not a common factor. And then there is this popular Kundalini business. Oh, that is very common. Indeed. Very common. <laughs> Uh, somebody came to me the other day, actually Maharaj, and said, my Kundalini has reached the Sahasrara Chakra. Now, what am I supposed to I said, you have to do nothing. Why have you come to me? <laughs> what do you do? <coughs> As if it's such a cheap joke. So, we have to look into all these <laughs> practical matters and go. So, thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed. So very nice Maharaj, yes, a very nice talk. We have enjoyed. Do you have any other question? <laughs> okay. All right. I just want to tell you, yeah. you know, I born in a Christian family. Okay. And I don't like to read the books. Okay. I don't know anything about the Bible or you know Bhagavad Gita, Mahabharata, Ramayana. I don't. I don't like to read the books. Okay. Because for me, I'm searching for the bhakti is the best thing. It's very easy and it's full of emotion. And what I'm searching for, even if I music or, or mantra, whatever it is, which take me to the contemplation. So what I'm searching now is only the contemplation. So it's made me to, you know, to I'm not I don't have any attraction towards the external world. I don't have attraction to, to have a friend or something. Even the family also, because I know whatever problem. Is that true, sir? 
<laughs> anyway, so sorry. The problem comes, I forget everything once I get into the, the contemplation. So it's just the easiest way. Only Not for all. See, please, we, you may say that's the easiest way for me, but there may be others who have a different opinions. It's coming from the past life? Maybe. Without Unfortunately, I don't do this past yeah, life I, regression. I past is past, is <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, everybody is doing past life regression. I've always keep. You, yeah, you, you. If you are in a hypnotic trance and if you are told you are the Maharaj of Jodhpur, oh, yes, you will believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>